When I say I love you more, I don't mean I love you more than you love me. I mean I love you more than the bad days ahead of us. I love you more than any fight we will ever have. I love you more than the distance between us. I love you more than any obstacle that can come between us. I know this because I want to kiss every 90 degree angle you used to say goodnight with. I need you to understand I fall asleep best to the beat your heart makes. With our rhythm sinking together to make one. And with this love, one plus one could one day turn into three. Adding to this wonderful family of adventure seekers and wanderers. Knowing to one day lead, we must first be followers. And I would follow you through fire and brimstone in the constant pursuit of our heaven past any despair. I would kiss your lips as if your skin were made of braille. I don't want to feel you up. Let me fill you out. Breathing joy in the form of helium into your lungs. Let our tongues be the broken barometer, spinning fast, judging how high we can float. On past skylines, we'd hang and coat the night with our shine, emitting a light so bright, mere mortals would look up and call you Venus. I 
call you Aphrodite, my North Star. When I get lost in life's traffic jam labyrinth, I look into your eyes and know heaven's not too far. Now, trust me when I say that I'm not here to brag nor boast. I just ever so simply want you to know I love you the most. Poetry Girl, Poetry Slam. Happy New Year's. Well, in a few seconds, it will be New Year's. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for saying yes to my poets. Man, we're going to walk into 2021 with our hell heads held high and with our spirits filled with joy. And for the next 60 minutes, I want all of us to come together digitally and just worship. We're going to worship through scripture and interpretation. We're going to um, um, worship through song. We're going to worship through spoken word. 
thank you once again to all my poets that said yes. Thank you for all those who are reading scripture and said yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I pray, and I pray that each one of you guys who are watching or might watch it later are blessed by this service. My name is Mashaka T. McKenzie. I am the CEO and founder of Portugal LLC. We are all things digital. We help people build websites. We, um, we, we coach people through social media, ministry, or your small business or your church function and grow well. Porch Girl LLC got you. But I pray, I pray that today's, tonight's service will bless your socks. Thank you. What's up? I'm Jason Villegas, and these are my thoughts on the past year. 
This past year, I yearned for peace and it burned like hot grease. My eyes shed tears and my heart held fears and groped hopes that came and went like a C-grade actor's accent. I had emotional toil and turmoil that got spent on everything that cemented me to my offspring. But I felt like I had nothing to show for it, like the person who wades into a river trying to grab handfuls of water to take to the bank. We watched wildfires burning out of control and beguiled buyers behind masks trying to buy their way out of the hole, trying to just feel whole. We tried at one point to presume that we could consume our way out of the pain by being frivolous with our government-given stimulus handed out like the mailman was St. Nicholas. We watched political figures taking collective pain like poker chips played to turn us into blockades against each other. I watched this polarization threaten to take a Christian mother and have her ignore her son, a man like my brother, until he would smother himself crying into his own shirt when his mother turned him into the other. It's been like a year without vitamin D from a sunbeam. We're getting agitated like the ancient Israelite versus the Philistine, like the cigarette addict at home without nicotine, like the feeling of withdrawal of what we need from the bloodstream. It's so helpless to feel cut off from the parts of what we thought we needed for our body, like a head from a guillotine. We want to experience life in person, but it looks like a faded picture in a magazine. We want to be awakened to everything, but it's like we ingested Dramamine. This angst is what it's like to have been so long in quarantine. We're people who want to do, to take life like a starburst and chew on it until its durable edges turn to juiciness and we can taste what it's all about. But instead of doing, we're only viewing, like someone who practiced canoeing a river and came to a mountain and is looking for a fountain to flow past the peaks, but we can't even find a creek. How do we get past these mounts that we can't even count, that we weren't trained to surmount? We're just standing and staring and sitting, and we have analysis paralysis. Instead of being a team player, we're each and amateur psychoanalyst trying to figure ourselves out, trying to turn around this route. This past year has been so rough that we only want to hang on to what's normal, but what once was is now abnormal. We can't help but quarrel because holding on to the old way is like trying to survey Pompeii. It's passing away. Our comfort food that once covered our bad mood and filled the cupboard is more numbered than we wish. And we wish now for something else. But we must try a new dish because life is dishing out something new and we can't keep fishing in empty ponds. What I mean by this is we have to reevaluate our direction Churches can't survive on an empty collection. Relationships can't live without affection. We can't just cancel people out because of a single objection. Societies can't continue with disconnection. We can't be carefree without stopping this infection. Our problems won't ever be changed with a single election. Our society has reached a point of maximum inflection. We need to make a way of life out of course correction. We need to dig deep with intentional dissection. Our bodies, souls, and minds need to be inoculated by an external injection. And even then, there's no guaranteed protection. What I mean is, we can't run from the fact that we will experience death and then resurrection. Hello, I'm Evangelist Shalita Bateman. First Lady of the City Church in Chase City, Virginia. And the scripture I'm going to be reading for you today is Luke chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to, unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. 
and he that seeketh findeth and to him that knocketh it shall be opened the scripture is so special to me because it reminds me of when i was a little girl and you know that game that you used to play hide and seek when you were kids and you would have to go around whoever was it and try to find the other ones that are hiding well i like to think of god as almost like that instead of us constantly have to go around and try to find him he's already there the scripture says all we have to do is knock or just ask and he will answer us and we don't have to do a lot to seek him he's already present he's just waiting for us to knock or just seek him and ask hey god how are you hey god i need you hey god whatever the case may be and so you don't have to be my personal belief you don't have to be an evangelist or a minister or a pastor to be in that kind of relationship with god he loves those that are not saved or not the closest to him because those are the ones who may seem to seek or need him the most and he's available to everyone whenever you may need him all you have to do is seek ask or knock and he'll answer god bless proverbs chapter 13 verse 4 coming from the new king james version the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich so looking at the first part it talks about the lazy man having desires but yet having nothing it's easy for somebody to want to have things and desire all these great things but are you willing to put the effort in that comes behind that? Because I know plenty of people that make all the excuses for why they don't have this, why they don't have that. But when you look at the matter of the fact is they really not putting the effort towards getting to that. And so they'll forever go through a cycle of wanting to have all these great things such as a nice job, or education, more money, this, that, and the third. But they're not willing to put forth the effort to get that. Now, if we look at the second part, it says, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. And it's hard to be diligent because that requires going through some tough things. It wouldn't seem like it might not work out, being able to stay focused on what the task is. And that's a challenge. It really is because, you know, and a lot of things you may see every reason to give up. But if you keep pushing forward through that, you won't get to the other side of it. And you're going to get the reward because of all the hard work you put in. It goes back to what kind of seeds are you sowing? Are you sowing the seeds that's going to get you to what you're trying to go to or are you not? Because you can go out and do every party, but then be mad that you're not getting what you want. Or you can skip a couple parties or skip this event or miss this. It's not going to put you towards where you're trying to go to and then get what you want. And that, in that sense, you'll be made rich. This is a throwback. For all those who've been following me over the years, this is a guaranteed throwback. And the title of it is Bible. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving this earth. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Bible is a guide. The Bible is a guide. It gives us examples of how to walk on earth, how to live on earth, how some people dealt with death and how some people dealt with love and how some people dealt with not being able to have a child. And the Bible is an, an example. It, it is an example of how to live on earth. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving this earth. The Bible have example after example. Let me give an example that the Bible gives. The, the Bible tells us to, to love our neighbors. Um, the Bible tells us to, 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 to take care of our temple and our temple being our bodies. Uh, the Bible tells us that, that, that we should take care of those who have less than. The Bible tells us that we should love each other. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving this earth. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving this earth. Hey everyone, Nick P here. And I just wanted to let you know that I need you to survive. So I pray that this next election is a blessing to you.
and I come into my junior year, and I'm about to get exactly what I wanted. About to get this thing called NFL. And I'm 10 games away from this dream that I wanted my whole life, right? This thing that I've been working for my whole life. My whole life is dedicated to this one game. I'm up Saturday mornings, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, two miles to a fire station, two miles back home. I'm in the park, 9.30, 10 at night, doing everything in my life surrounded the game of football. I'm sitting at home at night. I'm throwing balls up to the ceiling, and I'm catching them different type of ways, trying to see if a receiver was to check me, if I wanted to catch an intercept. Like, everything revolved around this game, and I finally get in a position in my life to where now I'm 10 games away from it. I got the paperwork that states I'm about to be an NFL draft pick. NFL on top of the paper. Inky Johnson projected top 30 automatic multi-millionaire. Now all you have to do, the hard part's over. Just play the next 10 football games, Ink. You, you, you made it. And I go out in a silly game against Air Force, two minutes left, and I go to make a tackle that I can make with my eyes closed. And I hit this guy, and as soon as I hit him, I knew it was a problem, but I didn't think it would be this type of problem. Like, you know how when things happen, you're like, ah, oh, I didn't expect that, but I don't think it's going to be anything too crazy. And when I hit him, every breath in my body left. My body goes completely limp. I fall to the ground. I blacked out. My eyes open. I'm still not, you know, too concerned because it's football. I told Pastor, I never thought about a career in an injury. You have injuries within the game. When my eyes open, guys run over, ink. let's rock, man, let's go. Let's finish him off. And I'm like, I, I can't. They're like, what do you mean you can't? You're a starting corner. Get up. You can nurse your injury after the game, man. I'm like, no, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? I said, I can't move. It's a shock. Neck to my toes. I can't feel anything. Shock leaves. It stays in my right arm and hand. I'm like, maybe I got a bad stinger. They put me on the spine board, willing me off the field. Doctor says to me as he's walking beside me, I don't know how you're still alive, son. You don't have any pulse. We get to the ambulance. My father's standing there. I'm like, Pops, I laid it on him, right? I put it on him, right? My dad's like, yeah, but I think you got the worst part of this one, eh? Doctor said, we're going to take you over, run a couple tests, bring you back into the room. Everything will be cool. They run the test. They bring me back into the room. Mom comes in, kisses, prays. Son, you'll be fine. She's going to walk out. Doctors rush in. Head boy says, hey, ma'am, got to rush him back to surgery. He's about to die. And I look at him, and I want to ask him, like, man, you can't use another word. Like, use a synonym, brother. <laughs> how y'all say die? Like, you sure die, man? And he could tell from how I'm looking at him that I'm questioning him. And he says to me, you ruptured a subclavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. If we don't perform this surgery tonight, I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. seven years old to 20 years old boiled down to one moment. The sacrifice, the dedication, the commitment came down to one moment. And the next morning I woke up from that surgery, the NFL on my scale of life that big. SEC championship that big. Cornerback, that big. I was embarrassed. I'm sitting there and people coming into my room like, Inky, man, um, I'm sorry about what happened to you. And I'm saying to myself, uh, man, Inky, you really messed it up this time. Like, man, that's really the only thing you wanted, huh? Like, you just thought because you grew up in this um, so-called hood, two-bedroom home, 14 people. Like, the only thing you really wanted was the NFL. That's it. I'm like, man, you limited God to that? Like, life holds no substance, no value. Like, efficient but not effective. I did things right, but I never did the right thing. And now the thing I placed my identity in, now it was gone. That's why I laugh at people when they say, man, if I could just get this, I'll be... Man, if I could just get this position, I'll be, woo. Man, if I could just get this amount of money, I'll be, I'm like, woo. But what happens even if you get it or you don't get it? What happens when God says yes and no? Like, do you have the ability to accept what you don't understand? Can you still see God's plan when it didn't go the way that you thought it would go? 
can you handle when things get off course? I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, like, man, I'm eight games away, and God is redirecting me, and I'm like, God, just let me get to the NFL, then redirect me. Like, let me get the contract, then redirect me so I can help my family. And God is like, no, son, I need you to really go that way. And I'm like, you sure? Like, man, I need to go this way. He's like, no, I need you to go this way. I got something greater for you. Now, it might take a little longer to manifest, but I got something even sweeter. Like, I got something more fulfilling. I got something more rewarding. I got something, son, that's going to carry you for the rest of your life. Like, it's an amazing thing. I knew this was what I was supposed to be doing when one day I'm backstage and I got the same feeling that I got when I used to be in the tunnel before I was running out of Neyland Stadium. And I said, thank you, God. And so now I live my life a certain type of way according to what God has done. I live my life a certain type of way according to the power that I know the Lord possesses. I live my life a certain type. Like when I go to the Lord in prayer, I go bold. And every time I go bold, I'm so thankful that that's not me and my Lord's first time communicating. And people have the nerve to ask me all the time, Inky, why wouldn't you change what happened to you? You got a paralyzed right arm and hand. I'm like, if you only knew and if you only saw the works that God has done in people's lives around me, what he's done in me, yeah, it's great, it's cool. But what God has done in the people's lives around me, like, you can't put a price on that. Like, at a certain point, like, what is it really about? Like, and I know the initial reaction when we go through things is to say, man, why did this have to happen to me? And it's an honest reaction. Because sometimes good people go through some crazy stuff. And some of the things we go through, I'm going to just be real, it's not, a, it's not a scripture for it. It's not. You can't go, hey, go to Romans 2-2. They're like, what? It's not. But this is what I've understood. In life, some people don't need you to preach a sermon. They need you to live one. And so when they see you living it, they can connect and identify with that. The only thing I ask of you, as talented, as brilliant, as powerful, as beautiful as you are, never allow life to make you forget why you started in the first place. Meaning that first time you said, man, I'm riding with Christ, let's go. That first feeling you got, like that first interaction, that first connection you got, like when you first got it. It's like when people say at, at the beginning, everybody is excited, everybody is on fire, but at a certain point you hit something along the journey and it's going to test that level of commitment. At a certain point you're going to hit something, it's going to test that level of faith. And my definition of commitment was always staying true to what I said I would do long after the mood that I've set it in has left. Like, am I going to stay true to my beliefs and my core and my essence of who I am as an individual, even if I get a paralyzed right arm and hand? Am I going to stay true to it, even if my little career that I thought I was going to have disappears? Am I going to stay true to it, even if one day I'm in a football game, the thing I love to do, the thing I have been practicing my whole life, and then one moment it gets wiped out? Am I going to stay true to it? Because depending upon if I'm going to stay true to it, a lot of other people's belief in their Christian journey is predicated upon that and my belief in my Christian journey. In other words, I've seen a lot of other people say, Inky, I want to give my life to Christ, not because of something that happened with me, but because of something I've seen happen to you. Greetings, God bless, what's up? It's your boy, Rev Kev, poet. Proud HBCU graduate and campus pastor for the I Love Jackson State University. We're sending a big shout out to Poetry Girl LLC for allowing us the opportunity to showcase just some of our talent. And on behalf of the Jackson State University Wesley Foundation, we pray for continued partnerships in the creative arts with you all. And with any, with no further ado, here's a piece that I have written entitled I Am. A sly fox on the tube box told me that I'm just another drug dealer full of liquor just trying to get another hit of that ganja. My watch simply serves as a reminder that by the age of 21, I'm either in jail or hellbound. Wow. But I'm here today to say as Africa brought forth life and as the clouds are to the sky, who am I? I am. I am the voice of the unheard community. I'm the intellect of an undermined people. I'm a humanitarian at heart, yet forced to stand for race due to the fallen concepts of the social hierarchy. 
I'm the gesture of benevolence towards a belligerent oppressor by any means necessary. Thus I am Martin Malcolm Luther Rex. I'm aware of the ways of others, yet still ever vigilant to my own. A miseducated veil won't blind me. I'm Michael Eric Steele rolling Dyson. I'm W.E.B. your boy. I'm ever present meets distant future. I'm conflict meets solution. I'm an employer and in prison. I'm the necessity to invention. I just removed all my Alpine speakers because I will not conform to stereotypes. I was here first, this first free, now free at last. Does that make me Alpha and Omega? Like Mother Teresa, I'm the pencil in the hand of a writing guy, sending a love letter to the world. Only this memo won't only come on the 1st and 15th. I have forgiveness, seek forgiveness. I have the remedy to my self-inflicted ailments. I'm an individual of African descent. Say her name, Black Lives Matter. I am, I am, I am an individual. I say. Once again, it's your boy, Rev Kev Campus Pastor for The I Love. If you want to follow me on social media, you can check me out on Facebook on at Kevin Kosh on Facebook and at I am Kevin Kosh on Instagram. Thank you, Pretty Girl LLC, for this opportunity. The I Love appreciates all that you do. Peace. I'll fly away. Oh, glory. Dear God, since when did we start holding funerals at crime scenes? The devil wrote scriptures on the yellow tape, and, and I, I can't help but read it and weep. I wonder what it sounds like when, when prayers, prayers take a commercial break and, and let, let bullets break, break the silence. They say a gunshot is the loudest kind of silence. I wonder what it felt like to be Christ-like, carrying a burden of a race he hated, wrong time, wrong place. I thought bloodshed on a crucifix meant lives were being saved. And come as you are was not addressed to hate, but still, the doors of that church remain open. Now, I don't know whether to pray on or pray for evil, because both can be done in the same place. What, what happens, happens when, when sacred, sacred turns to scared? And, and holy leaves you holy. Massacre at, at mass. mass. I wonder what their final prayer sounded like our father who, who are, are in heaven. heaven gunshots echoing from the choir stand our father who are in heaven swapping bullets for blessings our father who are in heaven evil and wickedness dwell in high places our father who are in heaven can you close your coloring book and paint us equal i'm not quite sure what her future looks like right now she's probably questioning god thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven watching the devil make mockery of golden strings brass knuckle fist angels and clip their wings harp strings like nooses wrapped around the neck of faith and leave it dangling like strange fruit Give, Give us this day our, our daily, daily bread. bread. She'll struggle with forgiving her trespasses. Who knew at five, playing dead would save her life. Battling, Battling the, the devil in God's arena. The Lord is my shepherd. Even when the wolves come through, I shall not want another day if he says I'm through. He, he leadeth me beside the still water. I will follow through the tallest waves. I can't imagine running, running from the place they told you to run to. In, in your, your darkest, darkest moments, moments, we talk so much about when the saints come marching but in. But never thought I'd see the day they get taken Having out. Having your funeral in the same type of place you spent your final moments. Dying in blind faith. I just hope their prayers were delivered on time. If, if not, not, while I'm, I'm still, still here. here they can have mine. Yea, though I stand in the altar of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with us, helping to paint us equal to the shooter. I hope the hell built for you is miserable. And if God's vengeance is swift, you'll get what you deserve by the time we finish this. Once again, my name is Mashakati, and I am Poetry Girl. The title of this poem is Tomorrow is Better. Tomorrow is coming. That is a guarantee that tomorrow is coming. But what's not guaranteed if you was going to be in your right mind? Tomorrow is coming. 
That is a guarantee. But what's not guaranteed if you're going to be in your right mind? I challenge you right now to, to take the opportunity to get to know your mind, body, and spirit because those things will help you for your purpose. Be intentional about walking into your purpose. We are about to celebrate a new year. A new year is coming. Are we ready? I dare you. I challenge you right now to be intentional about your purpose, understanding your purpose, looking for your purpose, listening for your purpose, writing your purpose, understanding that God has a purpose for each one of us. Purpose. Tomorrow is promised, but what's not promised is us being in our right mind. Tomorrow is promised, but what's not promised is us being in our right mind. So I challenge you right now to take the opportunity to get to know your mind, body, and spirit. Your mind, body, and spirit is what God tuned into to tell you what to do. A lot of us are trying to figure out what God wants us to do, but I'm telling you, it's within you. What's in you is what's going to come out of you. And if you are in tune, if you're in a relationship with God, God will help us with what our purpose is. So I challenge you right now to be in tune with your mind, body, and spirit. Tomorrow is promised, but what's not promised is our mind. What's not promised is the breath in our body. So I challenge you right now to get to know your purpose. So your purpose, so you can be intentional about walking into your purpose. I challenge you right now to be intentional about your purpose. Because when you walk into 2021, that you understand what God is calling you to do. I challenge you right now to be intentional about your purpose. Tomorrow is promised, but what's not promised is the breath in our body and us being in our right mind. Tomorrow is promised. But what's not promised is the breath that's going in each of our bodies. Thank you. I wrote this one thinking just about what this past year has been like. I just kind of threw it down with a bunch of rhyming words. Time doesn't care about years, doesn't care about our fears or our divisions of time and space. It just grinds like gears on an old engine, the sound of which hurts our ears. A virus doesn't care about your feeling. It only wants to live on whoever is revealing their open mouth or eyes or unwashed hands. Every time we thought it was waning, a new ceiling appeared overhead as COVID was stealing lives and loves. And we were praying and kneeling, reeling in pain and retreating instead of healing. A mask doesn't care about the expression on your face as you wear it to face the day with at least six feet of space between you and your neighbor, trying to find your best place. A mask will obey you, whether it's on your chin misplaced or hugging your lips with a salty, sweaty taste. Facebook does not care or share in our human emotion as long as it has souls to give it devotion. Humans that polarized the pandemic with opposite motion subtly being siloed by themselves by ads and promotions retreating to what's familiar whenever there is commotion. Polarization is a symptom like natural disaster a sign that we are disintegrating a bit faster, roaming amok like sheep without a pastor. We are novices in need of the voice of a master. Quarantine has taught me a thing about calamity, that I need belonging like the S after the apostrophe, that no individual has the moral high ground post-catastrophe, that without Internet, life illumines our incapacity, that my nationality hasn't the sanity for hospitality, but that I can act towards others with congeniality. So after a year of brutality caused by abnormality, we see a whole host of elements uncaring in reality, and a new informality arises like a new spirituality, and it's available to all with universality.